Always I Yell It is the foremost internationally acclaimed authority on developing true connections. I Yell It is the founder and CEO of Universal Connections, Inc., the world's premier relationship firm that is revolutionizing life through holism and truth. A highly sought life and relationship coach, professional matchmaker, astrologer, philosopher, and author, I Yell It is always I Yell It. Today's episode of Always I Yell It is brought to you by Meze Grill and usgoldcoins.com and carpevm.com. Thank you and welcome to the, and thank you for joining me. I'm sorry. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for the commemorative episode of Always I Yell It in tribute for the victims and survivors of the attack on America that occurred 10 years ago today on September 11th, 2001. That day forever changed the lives of New Yorkers and Americans and our lives will never be the, will never be the same. There's a lot I wanna talk about tonight and I have with me in the audience, in, in my studio, two very special honored guests that are honoring me with their presence, William and Christine Koch. Um, but before I introduce Bill and Christine, I have a few points I would like to make with regards to the attack on America on September 11, 2001. This attack, the, the act that occurred was so horrifying and so heinous that it's beyond words to describe. In fact, when I was preparing for the show earlier this afternoon, I, I was at a loss for words, which is not usual for me, um, to, to describe what, what exactly happened. And what happened was an act, an act of war it was a preemptive strike against the United States of America, against liberty, freedom, all that we hold, all that we stand for, all that brings us here as Americans from all nations, from all religions, from all backgrounds to be one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And our enemies, the attack that was preempted upon us weren't by you know, men in uniform that we could identify as was the case in Pearl Harbor, in Japan, in World War II, and all the preceding wars that we suffered as, as Americans. Our enemy was from within, and they used our American life, our values of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness and freedom to perpetrate un non-suspecting, unsuspecting, innocent civilians and destroy the lives of so many, of so many Americans and so many people. I have some statistics about the attack on 9-11 that occurred. The time of impact of the first tower was 8.46 a.m. The second tower was struck at 9.02 a.m. The time the burning towers stood, 56 minutes and 102 minutes. The time they took to fall, 12 seconds. Do you realize the importance of those statistics, folks? It took at least five to 10 years to build those towers and in 12 seconds, seconds in the blink of an eye, they were annihilated and destroyed and with them took so many American lives, so many fighters for our liberties, for our freedom that perished, our firefighters, our New York Police Department. There were 2,819 dead in the towers alone from 115 different nations. 343 firemen, brave souls who went into burning burning a burning inferno of a living hell and perished on that day to protect New Yorkers, to protect American civilians. 
in a feat that was beyond anything they knew or understood at that time. There were 23 New York PD casualties and 37 Port Authority officers who perished on September 11, 2001. This attack is so horrifying, but again I reinforce that it was an, an act of war and, was, and it was enacted in, as a strike of terror a well-organized, well-planned, well-executed attack that was perpetrated upon us, unsuspecting, innocent civilians. And this strike, although it was relatively new to New York and the United States of America as such, is not new. This is not new in other parts of the world, folks. Terror attacks are every day everyday common occurrences throughout the world and especially in the land of Israel which is very dear and close to my heart. A terror attack is an act that represents no respect for life, no respect for liberty and no respect for humanity whatsoever. This is not an act of defense, this is an act of war and when you're using our civil liberties as a means with which to perpetrate their attack on us there's nothing more heinous there's nothing more despicable there's nothing more I, I can't say animalistic because you know I'm in love with my little boy Oscar and, and animals don't behave this way it's just hateful it's only human. Only humans have the capacity to hate in such a, in such a, to, to such a degree. It is hateful, it is horrific, and it is terror. And I wanted to take a few minutes before I introduce my guests to describe and to perhaps share some insights of what terrorism is. Terrorism isn't just a word on the, in the media. Terrorism is when anyone, and this happens in all facets of life. It could happen in your home, it could happen in your, at your job. It's when a coward, in my view, someone without any backbone or ability to be a, a decent human being, wants to assert his power, control, and dominion over another, has no substance in his pursuit whatsoever, and thereby bullies, and bullying is a very big word in our society today, especially in modern day high school. But bu bullying is no different than terrorism. It's using vile, despicable tactics to assault another directly or indirectly and leave that other feeling afraid. Their sense of security, their sense of their natural rights of being of, of life and liberty and personal freedom to be and to live and to go about their daily existence is now threatened and will never be the same because of an act of terror. Acts of terror could be an abusive husband, an abusive wife, an abusive parent. It's any attack that is preempted or, or sometimes in some cases unconscious, but in, in the war on terror it's definitely orchestrated and planned where they willfully and maliciously and intentionally choose to use subversive insidious tactics to assault and suppress the individual personal power and liberty of an individual or a nation or a group of individuals or communities. Terrorism is a reality folks. This isn't you know, just propaganda on the media, you know, in, in the media, in the newspapers. It's a reality for people to take and, and to attempt. There are some groups of people out there that are attempting to denounce, you know, that and come up with so many, I won't even go there, ideas of the cause of the attack on September 11th. And it was, in, it's, it's preposterous how they can organize three planes, to, and there's so much evidence to support the facts that happen and the lives that perish. So please, folks, as I've urged you in the past, I urge you yet again, listen to your heart, 
if it's reasonable, if it makes rational sense, it is the truth. Terror attacks occur every day on this planet. Maybe not in New York City, thank God. Maybe not in New Jersey or California or Ohio, but they occur. And the attack on September 11th was an attack on America, an attack against everything we stand for, everything we represent, liberty, capitalism, freedom. Our security was shattered, but we are fighters and we are survivors. And as such, I choose to regard this episode, tonight's show, as a commemorative, not a memoriam to September 11th, but a commemorative, for we will prevail. Everybody, as I'm sure you've already noted, I've always, I always believe that everybody has a story. And if you ask a New Yorker or anyone living within a 100 mile radius of New York City where they were on September 11th, I'll bet you they have a story to share. Personally, my story is, thank God, not as bad as it could have been, but very interestingly for me, only five days before, I believe it was September 5th, I took a road trip from New Jersey, from Bergen County, New Jersey, where I reside, to Washington, D.C. I was in the process of organizing my, my company and registering my trademarks for my company. So if anyone knows me personally, I do it myself and I get it done. So I drove to Washington, D.C. on September 5th. I stayed overnight and on September 6th, I registered for my three registered trademarks for my company. And I uh, had dinner that evening with, with, actually I met with two old friends, work, work friends from previous incarnations. Um, one works for the SEC. We had dinner down in Georgetown and when he was driving me back to my hotel, which was in Arlington that night, we drove past the Pentagon, that I, which I have never seen before. I had many visits to Washington, D.C., but I have never seen the Pentagon. And he pointed it out to me. And I was like, oh, wow, that's where we do it all. <laughs> um, the following day, I had dinner with a very dear friend in Reston, Virginia, and we met up. I think we had lunch or dinner. It was a quick meet. I don't remember how long we spent together. And ironically, she was the one. And then I drove back home to New Jersey, to, to New York. To, I was residing in Fort Lee, New Jersey. So having just returned from a long road trip, the morning of September 11th was a Tuesday morning. I was awakened, a phone call at home, by my friend who I, who I had just seen in, in Reston, Virginia. She woke me up to, cause she, because she was concerned for me, knowing I'm a New Yorker, I'm in New York. I yelled, are you okay? She woke me up to the events that were already tr unfolding at, as of 8.46 a.m. on the television screen. I got up immediately. I went to the living room. I turned the television on, and I was literally glued to my television set the entire day. I believe at... I was just shocked. I remember being in utter shock. I remember being completely numb, but I remember without even... There was, at that time, at 9.45 a.m., at 10 o'clock a.m., there was no editorializing what was happening because it was still happening. It was still unfolding. The towers hadn't crumbled down yet. And I remember sitting in my living room in Fort Lee, New Jersey, looking at the TV screen and saying to myself, this was an act of war. I just knew it. I knew it then, and I know it today. And then, of course, what had ensued to unfold um, was quite compelling. The following day, I left my home to go about my business, and it was very sad. I, living in Fort Lee, New Jersey, which is not even five miles from Manhattan, I smelled the fumes of the jetliners that was in Fort Lee. I went to Starbucks, where I frequented every morning, and I learned later that day that on that same sidewalk, on that same sidewalk where I traversed each and every day and continued to and until I moved from that neighborhood to get my morning coffee, terrorists shared that sidewalk with me, shared those same footprints with me to access the mailboxes, etc., in the exact same shopping center in Fort Lee, New Jersey, where they conspired to, to, to attack the, the United States of America. 
I can't, I don't know if this resonates for each of you or for any of you in, in what I'm saying. Clearly, thank God I was safe. I was home. Everyone I loved um, was home safely. But I do love America. And I do love, I know that in, there's a photo on my Facebook of me posing <laughs> with two of America's, bra uh, of New York's bravest on a fire truck right across the street from the, at the time, World Trade Center. That image was taken in, um... 98 or 99 and you can see in the reflection of the photograph the, the reflection of the towers in the image it's, an, it's a very uh, eerie photo especially in today's light and I wonder if those beautiful firefighters are with us still today I believe they were in um, the 20th is it the 20th um, precinct or whatever but, but, but that's my story that's my story for September 11th 2001 and I remember thinking that we were at war. And I remember thinking also that now America gets a chance to see firsthand what Israel experiences every single day. And not just Israel. Terrorist attacks have occurred. And we hear about it on the news. So it doesn't mean anything to us. But every human life that perishes because of a terrorist attack or because of hatred of any kind should resonate for each of us, for each of us, because every loss of life, every life on this earth has meaning. So I just wanted to share my story of September 11, 2001. Joining me today, as I already noted earlier, is a very, my very special honored guests. They are here to share their remarkable story of survival and how faith and courage is manifest in their lives for better or worse. And with me today are the exceptionally beautiful William and Christine Koch. William Koch Jr. is the author of Casualties of War, Words and Images from the Heart of a Gold Star Father, Bill and his wife, Christine, were married in 1978 after an unrequited high school crush. They are lifelong residents of East Brunswick, New Jersey, where they were educated, work, and became the proud parents of three children, Lynn, young Bill, and Stephen. Christine is a nurse for the past 30 years and has been working in oncology for the past five years, while Bill has worked as an IBEW Local 456 electrician for 34 years. They have been married for 32 years and together they have struggled and grown with Christian and family values that are instilled in them and passed on to their three children. Their children Lynn, Bill and Stephen continued a caring and concerned effort to themselves and others. Stephen's service to his country as a member of the 82nd Airborne was a tribute to his older brother Bill, who was working at the World Trade Center in New York City and survived the attack on, on America on September 11, 2001. That day changed their lives forever. For Stephen, it was motivation to enlist in the United States Army, where he would make the ultimate sacrifice. Stephen's dedication and courage to defend his family and country deployed him to Afghanistan in January 2007, where he was killed in action on March 3rd, 2008. This heartbreaking tragedy was an overwhelming loss to the family, especially Lynn. She was like a little mommy to her younger brothers. Lynn suffered severely with post-traumatic stress disorder from the loss of her baby brother. This condition eventually resulted in her tragic suicide on May 6, 2010. Young Bill, who is not with us tonight, has just completed his training as an IBEW electrician. And Bill, Christine, and young Bill continue the family legacy of caring for others and paying tribute to our armed services and troops while working with groups that provide support, 
to veterans and wounded warriors. Thank you so much for, have, for, for being here today, William and Christine Koch. I also wanted to add, folks, that Bill and Christine, they exemplify one of the many, many all-American families ripped apart by the events that transpired on September 11th. And we mustn't ever forget, I must always remember, why we are here today, what brought us together, and continue on the positive legacy of faith and courage. And so without further delay, please allow me to welcome you, Christine. Thank you so much. And Bill. Thank you very much for letting us be part of your 9-11 tribute show. I really appreciate that. My, my absolute, it's my honor and my pleasure, and I know I brought some tears to your beautiful eyes, Christine. Um, why don't we talk about how we met? Or uh, We met through her brother, was a good best friend of mine, and um, eventually I got around to asking her out, and uh, we just went from there, <laughs> and uh, kind of been inseparable ever since. You, you know? had an unrequited <laughs> high school crush when, 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 when Christine... I think was a year younger than you in high school. Right. Yes. Um, what brings us here today is I was, I guess, planning a commemorative episode for September 11th. And we were networking online and you commented about my show and then I commented back and then I, I inquired a little bit more about Bill and I discovered that you lost not one but two of your children to September 11th. Tell me about that. Um, the resulting from 9-11 uh, attack on America, our oldest son, William, young Bill, was working in the city. He was uh, right at the Trade Center when it happened. Uh, our whole family was affected where we didn't know where he was at for 10 or 12 hours until he finally called home. Wow. Um, Lynn was at St. John's University. Christine was working in Middletown, I believe, at the time. I was working in Edison, and young Stephen was in East Brunswick High School. Lynn was at St. John's in New York? Yes. Yeah, oh, wow. In, yes. Mm -hmm. So and she was in, coming into New York. Wow, mm -hmm. okay. So she was in New York, too. Yes. Um, but Queens. But I, I actually went back home to get a landline because none of the cell phones, and that eventually everybody called into me. And we just waited it out, and the first words out of young Bill's mouth was, I'm alive. I think he Thank called God. like 4 o'clock in the afternoon, finally we was able to get to a phone in, in Brooklyn. Where was Stephen on September 11, 2001? He was in high school. I believe he was a junior in high school. And uh, he was one of the kids that was affected, where they grouped all the kids into counselor's rooms or library. To If you, if you had someone in the city, all the schools reacted the right way, where they tried to keep kids calm because no one knew. you know really knew what happened what was there. going on yes I have to say Bill that when you and I first connected and exchanged our first dialogue I believe it was August 31st it was just very recently right um, and I learned I learned of the extremity that you as an individual man suffered and one of the first words I said in my in, very early on in the dialogue I said is your wife still sane because my heart my heart went out for you, and I just can't fathom for you two. Don't no no oh, disrespect to the father, but I'm always I always I guess attribute the way I was raised a greater um, affinity for for a mother bearing and birthing and raising children, and I just I can't imagine anyone enduring that degree of pain in such a short period of time, two young, beautiful children mm -hmm. to perish in such a way. I literally was moved to tears. I, it took me about 20 minutes to collect myself when, when I heard this story. Tell me what, how did this progress? I, I understand that Stephen was directly moved to enlist in the army. And, 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 and folks, um, it's, it's a natural occurrence, it's, it's, it's um, historically known that after every attack that Americans have ever suffered, um, Pearl Harbor, there was a grave of the, the America's finest, and I'm not talking New, York, New York's finest, I'm talking mm -hmm. America's finest, 
young, beautiful, brilliant American souls would go and not be drafted, but enlist and volunteer to sacrifice and put their lives on the line to protect their families and their country and to stand and to honor, to honor who we are and who they are. But, but tell me, tell me your reaction to Stephen when he first told you, I want to enlist. When Stephen originally told me he wanted to enlist um, as a mother, I tried to talk him out of it. I begged and pleaded. Um, what mother wants to send their child off to war? I'm very proud of him, but I talked him out of it. I actually held him off for two years. Really? I did. Um, I did, did my best. Um, How did you manage to, to do that? Just he, he just listened to me. I just, I just, please, Stephen, please don't. What was his argument? What was he saying? He wouldn't, he actually didn't argue with me. Stephen was not really argumentative. Okay. Um, he just did odd jobs. Stephen was not, um, he did not want to go to school. He did not want to go to college. That wasn't his thing. So he tried mechanics. Um, he kind of liked it, and then they got bored with that. He moved on. He worked at a gas station. He worked at a pizzeria. He did everything and anything. In high school. Yes. Why didn't he go off to college like his siblings? Uh, Stephen did not like school. Okay. He, I mean, he very brilliant, very smart, but I, I he did firmly, not I, I like say, school. Yeah, some of he the greatest would, minds, in fact. I don't absolutely. like school. That's what makes him such a great mind because they absolutely. can't be regimented, they can't be controlled. Yeah, and that school was just not his thing. He didn't want any part of school. I, to I told him I would pay for it, just like we paid for his linen, Billy. Um, he, no. So uh, one day he just came home. The papers were thrown on the kitchen table. I'm going. I stared at them. I looked at him. I picked up the phone and called the recruiter and I said, What are his chances? And she said, well, you know, he took the test, he aced it, he can do anything he wants, but he wants infantry. So 99.9, .9, he's going off to war. And I, you know, I, I was kind of yelling at her. She was used to it. She's trying to calm me down. Right. But um, I had to accept it. So I hung up the phone, and that was it. Um, I did not fight with him. What moved him? What do you think moved him? Uh, the biggest thing that moved him was that his brother was in danger, that America was being threatened, that his family had suffered. He saw the reaction of his brother, who was suffered his own post-traumatic from witnessing what happened at the towers. Uh, anyone that was there or saw those pictures of people coming out of buildings and what happened Flying, to jumping all, out of the buildings and what so happened to all the firemen and the policemen there is, is tragic and it's it's traumatic. How how can anyone not be affected by that? So he. He really took that to heart, that he was protecting his family, his country, his freedom, and others. And he, when, he, when he got to Afghanistan, he was really um, dedicated to protecting others that could not protect themselves. He would talk about that constantly, that how important his job was there, that he, he fell in love with that ability to help other people. Um, in the United States of America at this time, Bill and Christine, I'm sure you're aware, there's a lot of negate, you know, liberal opposition to the war. And, you know, it's, I'm offended. As an American, I'm offended. As a Jew, I'm offended. And as an American, I'm offended because we are attacked. It is our obligation, our absolute life requirement to self-preserve first at all costs. We didn't pick a war. We didn't pick a fight, but if we're being attacked, we must defend ourselves. And I don't think many Americans really get what it takes to have, you know, in Israel, and in Israel, we're drafted. At 18, every Israeli, male or female, is drafted to the military. I think you're only, the only exclusions are if you're ultra-Orthodox, which, by the way, I have issues with, and or um, if uh, you just got married, um, you can defer it for a year or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. But every Jew in Israel is drafted to the military. And this is a day-to-day -day life, way of life, that every mother, like yourself, is sending her children off. You know, I, I just reconnected with one of my, my, my best friends from 25 years ago when I was going to university in Israel. I just reconnected with her, and her oldest son now is in the army. He's on the front. I mean, he's out there, mm -hmm. and he's also 
a, in, in infantry fighting. Your son was an 82nd Airborne paratrooper, though. Yes, he was. <laughs> I, am, I have to tell you, I, I love him. I never got a chance to meet him or hug him, but I absolutely love him. 82nd Airborne is America's Guard of Honor. It is, it is the, it's like, it is the, the elite. even in Israel, the Tzanchanim in Israel are the, they're like the best. Yes. It's like everybody knows that. And I am, I am so honored. They I are, am so moved. They're, they're prepared. 82nd Airborne are the only that are prepared to go out within 12 hours to fight a war. There's no other unit that can do that. Stephen was deployed to Afghanistan in January of 2007. He was killed in March 2008. Was he here? Did he visit you during that time? No. Oh, yes. Excuse me. He had a, he had a, a 10 day leave in June. Okay. And tell me about his visit with you. What was it like when he came home? It was much too quickly, first of all. I, 10 it, days is a short. Yeah, yeah, to do a 15 month tour, to be home 10 days, uh, it, went, it, was, it was come and gone. Um, right. I couldn't hug him enough. Um, I don't know, I just. Uh, it, he, his, he was very dedicated. He, you could tell the difference in him. He, was, he became mm -hmm. a very serious person. Huh. Um, uh, maybe a little bit of being staying isolated away from his family to a point of, of knowing that danger he was in every day. You know, we, we would talk on the phone and I would, I would think he would say, oh yeah, we just went out on a mission, we're back. And I would think he was safe. And I would say, oh, well, at least you're back safe. He said, there's no safe place here. There's no safe there's place. There's somebody watching us at all times. I mean, and that's part of uh, what we look at now and we try to remember that he was so um, dedicated to that honor of protecting other people, and, and, he, and he really felt that in his heart, that he was helping his family, helping his country, and he was. He, and he was a corporal. Yeah. And that is the importance of today, and my show today, is that this is a person we're talking about. This is someone's <laughs> life. This is someone's life we're talking about. Parents that birthed him and created him and gave him life, and, and, and beautiful people. I have to emphasize what an exemplary couple you are and I mean that in every extreme and I know that your life isn't fraught with ease at this time and there's tensions but you must stay strong you must continue the love if we don't and I mean that as Americans and as you as individuals and as you as a couple if we don't they win and then God 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 forbid Stephen perished in vain and we don't want that to happen never 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 my darling um, I was going to ask you something, um, tell me about, well actually we need to take a break for a commercial, but when we come back I want you to tell me about the events that took Stephen's life. Okay. So um, um, just stay with me, we'll be right back after these, these messages from our very valued sponsors. First, I'd like to thank... Mezegrill.com, where authentic Mediterranean food meets modern flavor. Now serving breakfast on 8th Avenue at 55th Street in New York City, just a couple of blocks south of Columbus Circle. And I'd like to thank USGoldcoins.com, that's 1-800-HOTCOIN, our trusted advisor for investments in rare gold and silver coins Andy takes the mystery out of buying silver and gold by holding your hand. They take a hands-on approach. Better to call and speak directly for current inventory. Again, that number is 1-800-HOTCOIN. And I'd love to thank CarpeVM.com. Seize your market. Say it with video. Charlie works closely with you from beginning to end to ensure that your video makes an impact. Video on the web is ideal to engage your viewers. And I'd love to hear from you. Please give me a jingle at my Ask I Yell at voicemail. That number is 212-569-6969. Again, my Ask I Yell at voicemail number is 212 569 
6969. Or you may email me at ayelet at onlyonetv.com. That's ayelet, A Y E L E T, at onlyonetv.com. If you ask me a question, I may answer it on an upcoming episode of Always Ayelet. And so without any further delay, um, we're back in the studio with the beautiful, exceptionally beautiful and courageous and faithful William and Christine Koch, gold star parents of Corporal Stephen Koch, who perished in Sabari, Afghanistan on March 3rd, 2008. His enlistment to the U.S. service was a tribute to his brother, his older brother Bill, who survived the attack on America on September 11th, 2001. So if you would, Bill and Christine, tell me what happened. How did Stephen die? Um, Stephen's uh, platoon, uh, probably about 20 to 25 uh, members, came back from a mission that they had been out for, I want to say, five or six days, I believe it was. And they had just gotten back to a, what they would call a safe base or a, a standing base or a forward base. And um, I believe they were only there maybe within an hour. And through the gates of this base was a truck driven by a suicide bomber that was loaded as an IED. What is an IED? Um, Improvised explosive device. device. Improvised explosive device. Correct. That means there was no there was someone was someone driving the truck. Yes. Someone was driving someone. the truck. So suicide someone, bomber. Right. Suicide bomber. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's 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 just the terminology. It could be a roadside bomb. It could be in a car. It could be left as a bag. What do they mean by improvised? Handmade. Handmade. They make put it together. Very interesting that you said it could be left as a bag. As a teenager, if you've watched my previous episodes, you'll know that I spent most of my teenage summers in Jerusalem and Israel vacationing, my, my summer vacations from, from America. Um, and I remember on the buses, in the bus station, you know, they always had signs, beware of suspicious objects, beware. And as an American teenager, I was just like, what is that about? I didn't understand the impact, the, the importance of that. Interestingly, today, actually today when I drove into New York, there were police Oscars hot, baby, your warm baby face. Mommy, sorry. Okay. Um, it's warm in here. Um, today, driving into New York, there were police, police guarding the, the Lincoln Tunnel, police guarding every corner of Manhattan. And all I did was roll down the window and say, thank you and God bless you for protecting us. And now today, there are signs on buses, signs in cabs, signs everywhere. Beware on, on bus stops, beware of suspicious objects. So we are now living in a land where terrorism is impending mm -hmm. any day and in, 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 in any minute. And we don't know. And it's scary. And then they're saying, oh, the liberals are saying, oh, well, we're, our, our privacy is being invaded. Well, do we, would you rather be dead? What is your privacy worth when you're dead? Yes. Exactly. Really? Yes. Um, I believe before the commercial where I lost my train, I thought I was asking about Stephen's visit to, to America when he came back for the 10-day leave. What was he telling you? What was he sharing with you about his experience? Stephen was very quiet. He did not talk about Afghanistan. Um, had he experienced death at that point? Yes. Oh, yes. T do, what, what do you know about well, it, Bill? Well, um, a lot of the times when they would come back and they would... They would take over back back take a, a village that the Taliban had been in and they drove them out they would come upon a village where everyone was killed as the Taliban would leave that and he would always a village say, of, of Afghani civilians yes because they, if they figured that they were going to go help the Americans they would kill them instead of let them live and leave the village right um, so there was a lot of times when he would say listen we're seeing things where we have to do things that I can never talk about don't ask me about them. and that's how he talked about it and then he would like open up a little bit with like what I had just told you, but it was very sketchy, but he would always come back. He says, I'm never going to be the same person. And um, we're really doing an important thing here. We could see how terrible the Taliban treats their own people. And w when you realize that they're willing to blow themselves up to take out... They have no value for life. Yeah, five Americans and 50 of their own people, that means nothing to them, you know. So it's... it's I'm always telling my audience, 
about love-based choices versus fear-based choices. And I try to encourage my audience to live a love-centered life, which is what I believe the American way is. It's truth. It's freedom. Any group. And this isn't about nations. This is about religion. This war transcends borders. It transcends our borders mm -hmm. here in the United States of America. I don't know if you've noticed how many mosques are being built. And this isn't about Islam. Because in Islam, there are some beautiful Muslim people. My best friend, seventh grade, Pakistani, Muslim. Muslims, I know you and I were talking pre-show, in our pre-show interview, and you were saying how Stephen, God bless his soul, got stars of David. I was totally <laughs> blown away by that. Stars yes. of, ta of David tattooed on his arms yes. as a tribute <laughs> because the Muslims hate the Jews. You know, it's not Islam that hates the Jews. It's a small group of psychotic, hateful people yes. that have no value for life or humanity. And what's, what's scary for us now is that, you know, our American way is maybe denying you know, is we have to do, you know, screenings and whatever, and some good Muslims might be caught up in this, and forgive us, but what, please understand as Americans, if you're living in, in the United States of America, if you're living in this world, and you are in fact not part and parcel of Al-Qaeda and Jihad and their, their extent, then, then, then roll with it, and show your papers, and be who you are, and be the Americans that you are, and we love, I think Americans love all people, of all religions, of all backgrounds, I personally, I'm not a fan of religion, per se, mm -hmm. but it's religion, it's fanaticism, it's fanatical religion. Nowhere in the Quran does it say, take the lives of other people, of infidels, I don't believe in you. It doesn't say, I, I assure you that there's nowhere that you can even translate into those things. And what terroristic tactics do they employ to teach their troops? to go and bomb themselves and kill themselves. Mm -hmm. What, we have 82 virgins waiting for you? And I mean, what is that? Yeah. In Israel, in Israel, the, 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 the occupying Arabs that are now occupying the, uh, Gaza and the West Bank, they teach five-year-old children that they dress up in Mickey Mouse costumes, they teach five-year-old children that Jews are bad, that Israelis are bad, and that we should hate and kill. What are you creating? Fear, fear, hatred, and, 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 and murder. Right, right. And we must take every measure to self-preserve and to fight. And yes, war is sad. No one wants to go to war. No one wants their son to go to war. No one wants to risk our lives. But it takes a lot of courage <laughs> and a lot of faith to believe in oneself enough to put your life on the line yes. to protect the lives of others. And I, for that, I wish to thank the New York Fire Department, the New York Police Department, all of those who perished on September 11th, your son personally, you, for the mother, and, and, and all the parents out there who, who, who gave the ultimate sacrifice and were the victims and survivors. We're here today to talk also as a tribute to Stephen. You authored this beautiful book, um, I've been reading it for the past few nights, Casualties of War, Words and Images from the Heart of a Gold Star Father. Tell me, William, what is a Gold Star Father? What are Gold Star Parents? Uh, gold Star Parents are parents of a, a soldier, man or woman, that serves his country or her country and perishes, gets killed in action. Um, we really honor the, the fallen hero, is the gold star hero. We just happen to be his family. So we're gold star parents, gold star sisters, brothers, spouses, children. So it's any, any, so, but, but wasn't there a distinction between gold star or silver star or purple heart? Like what are, what are the distinctions? Well, the, well anyone that serves the- I, I, did, I forget, I mean, does Stephen have a purple heart, I believe? Yes, yes, yes. So, so please tell me all the commendations that Stephen received on it. Go ahead, Christine. He's, he received the Bronze Star, that was his highest um, uh, medal. So the Bronze Star, the Purple Heart, uh, the Meritorious um, a Medal, the Afghanistan Campaign Medal, um, Good Conduct Medal. Um, War on Terror. No. I'm sorry? War on Terror. War on Terror. Jeez, um, oh, I can't. 
I can't think of them all. He's, he, okay. he received purple quite a yeah. And the Purple I mean, Heart. The Bronze Star is uh, Valor and, and Dedication, and, um, and, and Purple Heart is your Wounded in Action. Correct. You, can, you don't have to die to get a Purple Heart. If you are a wounded soldier, right. you do receive a Purple Heart. Now, you heart. were telling me that some of the proceeds of casualties of war go to wounded warrior groups yeah, we, we, and veterans groups. Yeah, I, I, we use the money that I, uh, some of the money that we would get from the book for Hope for the Warriors events. Okay, um, Hope, and that's hopeforthewarriors.org. Right. Okay. Um, American Legion events, other any veterans or, or military operations that we see that people are reaching out to help our wounded warriors. I think that that is the most important thing that our Gold Star families as a group can do is really reach out to these guys and girls that are coming back and they're wounded either physically or mentally. Um, it's, it's tragic and it, and it needs more help, it needs more funds, it needs more people to reach out to help them. And Absolutely. that's our way of giving back. That's all that keeps us going now. God right? bless you, God bless you. I have to say that faith and courage to me means that no matter what happens, to you, no matter what adversity you experience, you don't get more than you can get, A, so you can endure this, you will endure this, and you will survive, and you will prevail. Second, you mustn't ever forget who you are, what brought you here. It's your exemplary example, your remarkable example that created Stephen. That, that brought him to, to, to serve us in such a fashion and sacrifice his life in that way. That's you. You still stand. And he still stands within your hearts and within my heart and within all of our hearts. And I know that. So have faith in that and, and find some solace and consolation. I know it's hard. Um, your book is entitled Casualties of War. You suffered not one, but two casualties to this war. Right. Tell me about your daughter, Lynn. Tell me about her suffering and uh, how she became a casualty of the war, of, nine, of, uh, of the attack. I'll just I'll give you a quick rundown. With, um, Lynn's uh, suffered tremendously from post-traumatic um, disorder. Um, she was like a little mommy to the two boys. I mean, it really affected her like she was also a mother at different times for the two boys. And uh, it was really a struggle for her to get get past that um, loss of Stephen, uh, the tragic way, and, and the final outcome of that was too much for her to bear. I mean, all the Gold Star families stand on that line, but you know, when you cross it, it's, it's a, it's a no-win situation. And Christy wants to add to that. Yeah, I, what, I, what I wanted to say, how she actually got through two years of this, as far as I was concerned, Deep in my heart, I truly believed I was going to lose my daughter. Tell me when why, we lost Christine. Him. Tell me why. Because of the love that she felt. The, the three of them were extremely close. Um, how, how many years apart were they in age? Uh, Lynn and Billy are exactly 16 months apart, and then uh, Stephen is two and a half years younger than Billy. That's exactly so the way three we were. And half my, years. My, my, me and my siblings. So there's are three and a half years between Stephen and Lenny. Yes, um, exactly. But my she was. just. Um, she, she treasured her brothers. Um, she, she always did. They always looked out for one another. Um, but Lynn actually was in complete denial, and she told me that um, for 15 months she, she was waiting for Stephen. She flat out said, Stephen's in Afghanistan, and I'm waiting for him to come home. And that's did how, you ever see the body? Um, yes, Stephen, um, he, he was an open casket. To believe it they or not. They send you the body back. I'm so sorry to ask you these questions. No, that's, that's okay. They I, send you the body back? The body comes back through Dover Air Force. Every soldier comes back through Dover Air Force Base. That's and then, then they're picked up. You know, and who went to pick him up? Oh, at that time, you, you were not allowed to go to the base. It changed with our president. president. He changed that where families can go see it because they wanted to kind of publicize the, the, now, the war. That, that's my opinion. Okay. Uh, at the time, we were not allowed to do that. And no, we were allowed. Um, the public was 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 not supposed to be there. I, the, the, excuse me. The um, press. The, the press. Okay. Um, what happened was our casualty officer had told us that it probably may take up to ten days for Stephen's body to return. Unknowing to him, they must have gotten Stephen out of there 
that night or the next night, he was home within a matter of three days. It was such short notice because he was going to tell us. We, were, we would have been allowed to be at Dover Air Force Base when Stephen returned. But Stephen was back. He actually gave us a call and said, your son is home. It was, but it was during this presidency that is now, it's up to the family as whether or not the press can be there so as these families return. So who went returns. to see the body? Well, we, we didn't. Uh, I'm they, saying... So they sent it to you to New Jersey? Yeah, it, it, his body came back to, to the home. funeral home. That's what happens. He was he arrived at Dover, Dover Air Force Were Base. Were you hysterical, Christine? Yes. <laughs> and then in shock. We, you go, you kind of, you break down hysterically. Uh, I just know two soldiers, you know, came to our door at 9 o'clock on a Monday night. You know, at, it's quiet in our house. It's just Bill and I. Billy actually still lived with us, but he was out at the time. The doorbell's ringing at 9 o'clock. Bill goes to answer the door. I'm coming down behind him chasing my dogs, and I just see two soldiers through. We have a long window, and I see them, and I stop dead in my tracks. I already knew. There's no but reason. that's the first you knew. That's, That's the first, the first thing I knew, is that two, soldier, the two soldiers are at your door. No reason in the world for anybody to be at your door except to tell you that your son has been killed. So, of course, we let them in, and I did have my hysterical moment, broke down. I was actually beating on one of them, pushed him right out the door. But you saw his body? You saw him? We didn't. We saw him at his viewing when we had his funeral. So they, they fixed him up? Oh, yes. It was, and and I had asked. We don't, we don't go to wakes. We I know that. I, I understand yes. that. And... But I, I have been to several wakes in honor of people that, are, that I know in my life. Um, I was actually very adversely affected by having seen wakes. But, and I know they do a pretty good job in the funeral home, but what, well, it was up to what were his injuries? His, that's what it was. I had asked, am I going to be allowed to see Stephen? And at, the, at the, that point, the casualty officer had said, it will be up to the 82nd Airborne because you must look perfect or it will be a closed casket um, you have to look good and beings it was an IED in my mind I'm thinking oh my god my son was blown to bits but he wasn't um, so what killed him um, it was the, the building actually came down and collapsed oh, Stephen was stuff. was buried oh, be beneath oh, beneath rubble he was the last oh, the last god. to be pulled out because they knew he was they knew where he was um, but they had to get the injured first, um, and he was the last to be it's taken out. It's almost ironic. I didn't know the specific fact. I, 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 I tried to encourage you in our preliminary talks to save it for me, mm -hmm. but it's almost ironic that he got buried in a building when he came, was motivated by the, by, by the crushing of the Twin yeah. Towers. Yes, so his, the only... He, it, I, he was my son that I saw, and he looked... Beautiful. It was my son. He had a slight bruise on the top of his head that they, you know, did the best with makeup. But um, yes, it was an open casket where most soldiers with an IED, you don't have an open casket. It's closed. Usually, it's, you have thank a man's God, body. Thank God for that. Yes, I'm. I'm, that. I'm. I'm. I'm thankful. Very Christine, thankful. we're almost out of time, my darling, and I wanted to share. Um, I wanted to talk more about the book, but I hope you'll join me again on an up, maybe in a memoriam of. Um, Stephen for his birthday or on the date of his passing to talk more about the book. But last night I was perusing through the book and there was one particular poem, I don't know how much time I have left, um, there was one particular poem that moved me especially and I urge you folks to please, um, you can uh, find the link um, on the website, it's, where do you buy the book? It's Tate Publishing. TatePublishing.com bookstore and the name of the book is Casualties of War. Um, the link will be posted to the show as well. There was one particular poem that deeply moved me. I would like to share this with you. It's called Weighted Shoulders. Um, Bill, from what I understand, I'm going to just editorialize for you. He, in his sleepless nights, suffering through the pain of the loss of his children. Um, just tell us quickly or briefly uh, it, it, what inspired you to write this book. It, or it just came about where uh, you know where you can't, can't sleep. Um, you, I would be up for four or five hours a night and watching TV, reading the paper on the computer, and I just started putting um, words together of my feelings, of what I saw, what I didn't see, what you knew, what I knew, what I what I felt every day trying to go on. Um, <laughs> The first one was Empty Chairs, which was a little mini story of what I saw sitting in my living room. My empty chairs, the creak of the floor, the clock that stopped because we never restarted it. Uh, those words were all intertwined into a poem and it just built from there every 
couple of nights or sometimes I would write three in a night. It would be depend on my And then you got story. them all collected into one book called Casualties of War, folks. It's Casualties of War, Words and Images from the Heart of a Gold Star Father, William Koch Jr. Allow me to share weighted shoulders with the audience. Make no mistake, your concern is welcome to hear. Still, the cross of our loss is too much for us to bear. Weighted shoulders that were strong with family pride, home of fractured family tears that continue to be cried. We hold and respect the sacrifice that you pay. We hold the physical form for short day to day. There is no one else that can see what we feel. If we could request a pardon, God, hear my appeal. Where is justice that seems to hide from us now? Questions needing answers on why, where, and how. Seeing the color of pain on the sibling and parent, can you please explain the agony that's now been sent? I don't curse you or place the blame. The pain suffered by all is of losing one flame. Burning so bright that it has left us in the dark, still the shadow cast can douse us can't douse his life spark. Sentinel of security that has been taken off his post. True warrior, American treasure, bravery is lost. Sting of the defeat has torn at our very soul. Proud and solemn, we all wear stars of gold. They've paid the price of the ultimate fee, risking their life in the defense of our country. All that we, family, can ask the legions of mass. The hurt is permanent. Please don't expect it to pass. Beautiful, beautiful work. I, I can go on, but again, you have to buy the book, folks. Um, it's, a, it's really beautifully composed. It's from the heart. If anyone's ever, in any country, I know this show is being seen around the world. Anyone who's ever had a, a child, a son, a brother, a sister, a daughter, who's enlisted, who's perished, or hasn't even perished, but who's suffering, our troops today in Afghanistan, around the world that are protecting us, honor them. Honor them. Don't oppose this war. This isn't a war we chose. It's a war that we were drafted into. We were drafted, they enlisted voluntarily, but we were drafted as Americans, as, a, as loving, freedom-loving, liberty-loving, life-loving Americans were drafted in this war. And please, folks, don't forget, always remember the attack that happened on September 11, 2001. I know each of you has a story. I have mine. I shared mine with you tonight. And the Katas, I, I'm so grateful for you sharing your story with me tonight. I opened the show by saying that this family was ripped apart as many, 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 and millions of American families have been ripped apart by the horrors and tragedy of war. And as such, folks, don't lose sight of the family you have and understand what family is in the manner in which siblings like Lynn and Stephen and Bill loved each other and honored each other and protected each other and cared for each other, not just in words, but in deeds, in the depth of their souls. And if you're not saying it today, then it's time to pick up the phone and call and say, I love you, I care about you, and then bind together individuals and families, bind together and love each other while we're here. You know. This, I was thinking on the drive-in how I was going to open the show, and there's so much on my mind and so many ideas that, 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 that go through my mind as to how, to, how to, to open this show, but it's life, folks. We're here to commemorate the events of September 11th, but to celebrate life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and please always remember and never forget the beautiful soul of Corporal Stephen Koch, who perished for us, for, uh, for America, and, and the thousands and, and, and many, many, many families that have been ripped apart by this war. 
love, be kind to each other, and love one another, and let's stand together. Remember, united we stand, divided we fall. And let's um, put that flag back up and let it wave in the air for all to see that we, that love will prevail. Not the fear, not the terror, but we must be vigilant. So please be safe. God bless you. Be vigilant, be aware of your surroundings. And I thank you so much for joining me, for being with me today. I love you for your tears, no, but please don't cry because you're too beautiful. <laughs> and Stephen wants you to live. He, he died so you will live, so we will live. So choose life and love and just love you and self-preserve, my sweetheart. He did it for you, he did it for you, and he did it for me, and he did it for all of us. And I'm um, so grateful for you on the show. Um, folks, the book, again, is Casualties of War. Um, please stay tuned. I have another great show coming up next week. Um, with all my heart and all my love, I extend my greatest gratitude to the United States of America, to Mayor Rudolph Giuliani, mm -hmm. to Bernard Carrick, who were here serving our country on September 11, 2001, and to all who perished on that fateful day. Please always remember and don't ever forget, with all my love, I am always Ayelet.